Welcome to the American Shoulder and Elbow Surgeons Podcast. I'm Peter Chalmers, a shoulder and elbow surgeon at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City, and I'm joined today by my co-host, Rachel Frank, a sports and shoulder surgeon at the University of Colorado in Denver. Rachel, how are you? Doing well, Pete. Thanks very much. Great to be here as always. I should first mention that the views expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the views of the American Shoulder and Elbow Surgeons Society, the University of Utah, the University of Colorado, or the university or organizations of any of our current guests. Today, we have something really special for you. We are going to do a point counterpoint episode on the treatment of rat massive rotator cuff tears. I've invited three guests, each of whom is going to talk about a different treatment option in this scenario. So first we have Serena Nimdari, who's a um, shoulder surgeon at the Rothman Institute in Philadelphia. And he's gonna to talk to us about arthroscopic cysted lower trapezius transfer. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Nimdari. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Next, we have Rob Hartzler from TSAOG Orthopedics in San Antonio. Rob is going to tell us about superior capsular reconstruction. Rob, how are you? I'm doing well. Thank you very much for having me on. And finally, we have Dr. James Gregory from the University of Texas in Houston, who is going to discuss outpatient reverse total shoulder arthroplasty. How are you, Dr. Gregory? Doing well, Rachel. Thanks for having me on. All right, so let's get started. So, Serena, tell us in three minutes about the trap transfer. Sure. You know, the I think you can't mention the trap transfer without talking about Bassam El Hassan. He's the um, creator of this technique. He initially started using it to uh, treat uh, problems of paralysis, and then subsequently started using it to treat massive irreparable cuff tears. Um, traditionally, we've thought about doing a latissimus transfer for the type of patient who we, who we would indicate for a trap transfer. So it's usually the patient with an intact subscap um, looking to gain strength and with a very large uh, irreparable posterior superior cuff tear. And so the problem with latissimus transfer traditionally has been that um, while the repair can heal reliably, the muscle doesn't necessarily fire in phase during external rotation. And Jerry Williams and Joe Ainati have shown that. And so the trap transfer, the benefit of it is that biomechanically, um, it's more in line with the pull of the infraspinatus. And so uh, Ty Lee um, and others have, sh have shown that in biomechanical models, and it, and it better restores external rotation with the arm at the side um, than the latissimus transfer does. So as a result, it started to gain some popularity uh, for that indication, and in, for, in many surgeons' hands has supplanted um, the latissimus transfer in a challenging patient population. Thank you for that great explanation. Let's move on to Rob. Can you tell us in three minutes about superior capsular reconstruction? Thanks, Rachel. Superior capsular reconstruction uh, is a very interesting operation. Um, it was originally uh, described by um, a, a case report in 1993 uh, that was published in JSES uh, on a single patient, and um, it was a failed operation. It was um, repopularized by Mahata and um, biomechanical and clinical studies um, in around 2013 um, using uh, fasciolata autograft as a way to reconstruct the superior capsule of the shoulder in irreparable rotator cuff tears. Subsequently to Mahata's work in the U.S., um, human dermal allograft began to be popularized for this uh, operation, um, and many surgeons advocated uh, that as a way to avoid the morbidity of the fasciolata um, autograft. And um, since um, the mid, you know, 2000 teens uh, has been a wildly popular uh, operation uh, being done um, tens of thousands of times, um, judging from uh, the amount of dermal allografts that have been uh, distributed by um, Arthrex uh, in this operation. So um, I think that it's uh, definitely a testament to the complexity of the problem that we're um, talking about tonight, uh, namely uh, massive rotator cuff tears, which are uh, irreparable or predicted to be irreparable uh, surgically and um, superior capsule reconstruction uh, has definitely uh, proven itself uh, bo both biomechanically and uh, clinically uh, using a variety of different graphs uh, and techniques uh, from a number of different authors. It's an expensive operation. Uh, it requires a lot of uh, anchors and for those surgeons using 
um, dermal allograft uh, that adds a significant cost to it. Uh, but it seems to be a, a good observation. Uh, it seems to be a good op, um, operation for patients um, who are poorly suited for arthroplasties um, by age or activity level. Uh, seems to have a fairly um, good complication profile and um, and good clinical results. Um, so I think that it's going to be an operation that uh, stays in the tool bag of shoulder surgeons um, going forward for this problem. All right, and then James, tell us a little bit about outpatient reverse. Sure. Uh, so reverse sort of arthroplasty, as we know, we've kind of got a 16-year track record since the first arthroplasty prostheses were approved in the U.S. Uh, in 2004. And since that time, they're initially kind of focused on rotator cuff arthropathy, but indications have kind of exploded. Severe proximal humerus fractures, uh, revisions, and massive rotator cuff tears, even without uh, significant glenar humor arthritis. And so as we've gotten more comfortable with the efficacy and reliability of the reverse shoulder arthroplasty, and as indications have expanded, um, we've started to really look at how we can improve the episode of care for patients, how we can lower costs. And one of the ways of doing that is optimizing uh, the perioperative experience, uh, really trying to optimize pain control, um, minimize the length of stay to the point where we can really start uh, doing a lot of these surgeries on a same day discharge basis. And so obviously a lot of you know concern about same day shoulder arthroplasty revolves around um, safety as it should, but in appropriately selected patients without significant cardiac or pulmonary comorbidities, uh, same day discharge after reverse shoulder arthroplasty um, is very successful and is a really a standard of care for those patients in my practice. And so I think the key is going to be really appropriate patient selection for this procedure in terms of what we're talking about today, massive irreparable rotator cuff tears. But I think for the lower demand patient, someone who's older, um, someone who wants a one surgery that is going to be the most reliable surgery for a, for a very difficult problem, and someone who wants a quicker recovery, I think outpatient reverse shoulder arthroplasty is a, is a very good option for them, and I think has a very high likelihood of being successful. Hey, Serana, can you tell us in one minute, who's the ideal patient for a trap transfer? Absolutely. I mean, I think that's the biggest challenge is identifying the right patient for this surgery. And so I think some of the things that a patient really has to have for you to, to think about this, uh, for one, they have to be somebody who's looking to gain strength. Um, while pain and motion both improve, I think um, the right patient is really looking to gain strength, particularly in external rotation. Um, the ideal person has an external rotation lag sign and is looking to reverse that lag sign and all the problems that it creates. Um, the ideal patient has forward elevation that's preserved. So ideally over 90 degrees is what we showed in our study. Bassem El Hassan showed uh, greater than 60 degrees. He's a better surgeon than I am, so I needed 90 degrees. Um, you know, the other kind of factor that I think isn't talked about enough is the motivation of the patient is critical. I mean, this is a long recovery and a very difficult rehab, so you need somebody who's incredibly motivated to make this work. Um, I think as long as you have those factors and not significant arthritic changes, um, people can do really well with this surgery. Great. That is awesome. Now, Rob, same question to you. Who is the ideal patient for you for a superior capsular reconstruction? So, Peter, I think the first thing that I'll say about it is just that the way that I make that decision in my office is primarily to decide whether the patient is a candidate for joint preserving surgery or prosthetic arthroplasty first. In my practice, I have many patients who I indicate for reverses, for bad rotator cuff problems um, without arthritis. Um, so those are typically elderly low demand patients. For most, most healthy, active, younger patients um, with uh, bad rotator cuff tear problems, uh, I'm going to indicate them for some kind of joint preservation surgery. And many times that's just rotator cuff repair. Um, I think that it's important to point out that many bad looking rotator cuff um, problems will actually be repairable once they go to surgery. And I consent and counsel people about SCR a lot more than I actually 
um, a lot more than I actually do it. A lot of these chairs are repairable. So, um, but I'll consent people for either arthroscopic assisted tendon transfer or SCR if they have bad looking rotator cuff tear problems. I'm leaning towards tendon transfer, like Serena said, for patients who have severe external rotation problems, patients that I am leaning towards SCR for, uh, or patients that have minimal arthritis, have either an intact or a repairable subscapularis, um, and who meet those other patient characteristics. So um, I'm doing SCRs for patients who I, I take to surgery for those indications, but are found with at the time of operation to have an irreparable rotator cuff tear after I actually try to repair it. Awesome. Thank you so much. And then, James, same question for you. In one minute, who's that ideal patient for a reverse shoulder replacement, and in particular, an outpatient procedure? Well, to put it bluntly, it's basically everybody who doesn't fall into those two categories that they talked about. You know, the reverse is our workhorse. We can, we can you know, do very well. Um, and basically, the people that Rob had a good paper a few years ago where he looked at who did not do well with massive rotator cuff tears and got a reverse. And it's people who are younger, who had excellent shoulder function going in, so they had well-preserved range of motion, had good strength, it was primarily a pain problem. Those people aren't gonna see a big benefit from a reverse, and so they're gonna be unhappy. And so I would counsel those people away from a reverse, more towards a joint preserving operation. Um, other people, elderly, lower demand, people who failed previous rotator cuff repair, who really don't like the idea of going through a long sling immobilization, long rehab process, those people are great candidates um, for reverse shoulder arthroplasty and really anybody without cardiac or pulmonary comorbidities who has appropriate social assistance at home. And I think that the idea of going home the same day after surgery is a candidate for outpatient shoulder arthroplasty in my practice. So now that we've kind of gone through the ideal patient, I wanted to talk a little bit about the other guardrail here. So Serena, tell us in one minute, who, who do you think absolute contraindications and maybe the relative contraindications for a trap transfer? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great question. I mean, I think anybody who doesn't have a subscapularis that's either um, repairable, um, uh, that is not repairable during surgery would be a contraindication for me. Patients who are pseudoparetic, and, and when I say pseudoparetic, I mean the patient who really when they try to lift their arm, their humeral head almost hits them in the face, they're escaping. Um, that patient, um, I don't think can, can do well with, a, um, with an isolated trap transfer. I've done it in patients who are um, at that level, and I've actually been able to reverse their pseudoparesis in the sense that with scapular assistance, they can raise their arm again, but they haven't been happy because if you put a piece of paper in their hand, they can't lift their arm. And so they have an arm that goes up, but not with any real function. So I don't, I think that that's a, a relative contraindication at this point. And then certainly anybody who has a um, history of infection, I mean, you know, you're putting in a relatively large piece of Achilles allograft. And so it's a risk um, to do a, a tendon transfer and placement of a graft in the setting of a prior infection. And um, finally, I mean, the typical things that we think about in terms of deltoid function and nerve, at, ner nerve injury. So if they have those factors, they're probably also not a great candidate. Rob, same question your way, especially given the growth and popularity of SCR. Who's contraindicated for this? Who should not be getting this procedure? So I think the patients that I worry the most about are those with bad subscapularis problems. Um, as Serena said, um, that the SCR graft cannot correct that problem. Um, so patients who have had the subscap operated on before who have Gutelier three or four changes um, in its severe retraction, uh, those, those patients I'm going to lean away from SCR on. And then I also pay really close attention to the Terry's minor. So the majority of these patients um, have bad looking infraspinatus um, muscles, but the, the patients that have bad looking teres minor, Gutelier 3 4 again, patients that have exorotation lag signs or horn blowers in that setting, I just worry that the SCR graft is not going to be enough to restore uh, function or stability. So um, I'll lean towards tendon transfer in those, uh, in those patients. And I think chronic, you know, we've shown. Um, from San Antonio and also Mahada has that patients with severe elevation dysfunction, pseudoparesis, pseudoparalysis uh, can do well with SCR. Patients that 
are in that state chronically more than six months, I, I get nervous about that and lean more towards the reverse for those patients. Um, and then, you know, just as we said, the standard things and in, infection, bone loss, um, deltoid problems, other, other things would, which would lead you away from SCR. And then, um, uh, James for, for, Maybe both you could talk about reverse and kind of out outpatient arthroplasty. What are what are some of your absolute uh, red flags for that? Yeah, so for me, I kind of I kind of take a different approach. You know, obviously for for reverse shoulder arthroplasty, some of the indications are really clear, right? Severe, you know, arthritis, things like that, where we wouldn't really wouldn't be considering a transfer in SCR. The most common thing that I see is people that are indicated for reverse shoulder arthroplasty because they're older, but they have potentially a repairable cuff tear. And so I think in this discussion, we, we can't forget that, as Rob pointed out earlier, a lot of these tears can be fixable. And so people are sent to me for an arthroplasty who you know, are, are older, but have a repairable cuff. I think that should be the goal. Obviously, we should fix the cuff. And so um, I think, in, in my mind, uh, a contraindication is a repairable cuff tear um, and someone who you know, wants to try that. Um, contraindications, just like everybody else said, deltoid deficiency, particularly complete axillary nerve issues, infection, charcoal joints, um, things like that. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thanks to all of you for this wonderful discussion. It's really set the stage for this next part of today's podcast. So right now, what we're going to do is go through a few patient care scenarios. And what we're hoping for here is that each of you can give us either a yes or a no as to whether you would do your option, so the surgery option that you just described in this particular patient, or whether you would do something else. Ground rules here are that we're just looking for a yes or no answer. You can't ask for more information or we're never going to get through this. So here's scenario number one, and then we'll go with Serena, Rob, and James just giving us your yes or no as to if you would do your particular procedure. So this patient is a 50-year-old, heavy-duty manual laborer with an irreparable supraspinatus, an intact subscap, intact infra. They're able to raise their arm. They have no arthritis, just pain and weakness. Serena? Um, yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I would say, I guess, I, I guess I'll say, I'll say, I'll say no. Okay. Rob? Yes. And James? Am I saying yes or no for my technique? That's correct. Yes or no for a reverse? No. No. Okay. All right. So here's the next one. So 75-year-old retiree, irreparable subscap, intact infra, not able to raise the arm, significant arthritis. So what do you think, Serena? Would you do a trap transfer for this, for this patient? No way. What do you think, Rob? Is this an SCR candidate? No. And then, James, is this a reverse kind of person? All day. Is that, so just All to, day, to follow baby. up, is that what you guys, would each of you have done reverse for this person? Yes. Yeah. Yes. What do you think, Rob? Okay. Rachel, what about the next one? All right. Well, here's our next scenario. So we've got a 60-year-old office worker with an intact subscap, but an irreparable posterior supero cuff, um, and they're able to raise their arm, and they have no evidence of arthritis on their imaging. So, Serena, what do you think about a transfer? No. Rob, how about an SDR here? Yes. And James, would you just go straight to a reverse in this 60-year-old low-demand office worker? No. Okay. All right. Let's take the same same sixty year old office worker, irreparable subscapularis, intact posterior superior cuff, not able to raise the arm, no arthritis. So I think this is maybe a, hopefully a little more controversial. What do you think, Serena? If if the subscap is irreparable, are you going to do a trap transfer? No. What about you, Robert? Are you, are, are you doing an SCR if the subscap is irreparable or no? No. And then, James, if, if you have an irreparable subscap not able to raise the arm 60 years old, but no arthritis, is that a patient you do a reverse in or no? Yes, especially if they're kind of low demand. Let me ask you guys this. 
For that patient, the irreparable subscapularis, you know, we picked three options that I think are among the most popular, but that's definitely a place where, where we get a little bit, um, you know, there's a bunch of other things people are doing for the irreparable subscapularis. So Serena, what's, what's your preferred treatment now for the younger patient with irreparable subscapularis there? So um, my, my preferred option for that is actually the latissimus transfer. Um, I think the line of pull for, um, for an irreparable subscap is is better um, using a lat because it has a vector that's almost anterior to posterior. So theoretically, it can try to recenter a anteriorly um, or or the potential for dynamic anterior instability. It can counteract that, and so I think it's a e relatively easy operation to do. So in the younger patient, no arthritis, same type of patient that I talked about for the lower trap transfer. Um, I, I'll do a lat transfer for that irreparable subscan. What about you, Rob? Are you are you doing lat transfers or are you um, doing pec transfers or what? What's your preferred treatment now for the irreparable subscan? Well, I mean, if it if the patient had never had any surgery and they just had a bad looking MRI, I would still try to repair it arthroscopically and then go to tendon transfer afterwards. That's one of the things that Dr. Burkhart taught me when I was a fellow, and I saw. A lot in his practice is that the is that the subs gap you know oftentimes will look bad but will be able to be repaired doesn't seem to retract because it's tethered by the coracoid and its connection with the supraspinatus and there's a um, a significant tenodesis effect even if the muscle quality isn't that good so um, you know I would I would especially if the patient had, had not had prior attempt at repair would try to repair it arthroscopically and only go to tendon transfer if it was operatively irreparable. Now, what about you, James? We haven't really touched a, a ton upon the irreparable subscapularis. What's your preferred treatment currently for the irreparable subscapularis? So I kind of agree with, with both of these guys. I think, as Rob pointed out, a lot of times, you know, these, are, these look worse than they are. So I would definitely try to give it a repair. And if it doesn't work, I would do a latissimus transfer. Um, the setting where I mentioned yes for the other guy, you know, I think it's, someone who's essentially can't raise his arm and pseudoparalytic and someone who's low demand, I think is a reverse, but a lot of these irreparable sub tears, uh, subscap tears that I've encountered, they actually have pretty good range of motion. And so I think those people do well um, and they would not be a candidate for reverse, especially if they're younger, like in their sixties for that. Thanks guys. You know, another question for you, and I think this might be of interest to all of our listeners, whether, you know, they do arthroplasty, arthroscopy, both, et cetera, whatever's in their practice, which cuff patient, which type of cuff patient gives you the most pause in your practice? You know, what's that pathology where you see either on MRI or physical examination where you're like, huh, I could go this way or I could go that way. And I don't think with current literature and current techniques, we have a gold standard or the right answer. What do you guys think that that patient is and what does that look like? Uh, I can start. I mean, for me, for, yeah, for me, it's the um, young patient who has pseudoparalysis. So I think we have a great solution for the older patient with pseudoparalysis, as we've talked about, the reverse is the gold standard. Um, but when you have a young patient who truly has escape, cannot raise their arm, I do not think that we have a good, re good reliable option other than a reverse, which most of us do not want to do in somebody who's truly a young patient. So, you know, we can think about um, graphs like SCR and making them thicker and trying to reverse it. And some people have been successful. We can talk about tendon transfers to try to reverse those problems, but I don't think any of them are that reliable. And that's the patient that I think we have the most trouble treating. Yeah, I think those can be tricky. Rob, any other thoughts or do you agree? Well, I think that well, there's a couple of scenarios. I think the the patient with a bad rotator cuff problem where you're going to have some deficiency that needs strength, I think is a big challenge. And, um, you know, it, leaving aside, you know, motor dysfunction, just, you know, patients who need strength at or above shoulder level, um, who have, uh, who, who are going to have a rotator cuff deficient shoulder, whether they end up with a reverse or whether they end up with a tendon transfer or SCR, um, or partial repairs and debridement, that sort of thing. Um, you know, they, I think those, those patients you have to do a lot of counseling with. And, um, you know, I think we have, we don't have good options for giving, you know, for them returning to normal strength. Um, I think bone loss sometimes is a challenge, particularly in the revision setting, you know, 
most of these things that we've been talking about require, except for, well, I guess reverse, but the soft tissue operations, you know, require tuberosities to fix things too. And sometimes you'll get patients that have had multiple operations and they just don't have much tuberosity to work with. So I think that's a big challenge. For sure. Definitely challenging patient populations there. And James, any thoughts from you? Any any other patients that you think when you see these in the office, this is just tough and you're not quite sure what to do? You've got lots of options, but none seem perfect. So, yeah, I think that's a good question. You know, I think Seren and Rob highlighted two kind of very difficult patients to deal with. One of the things that I sometimes run into in my practice is, you know, I think we would all agree that you've got one really good chance at the rotator cuff. Um, if you fix it and it heals, you're going to do fantastic. If it fails, then you start down this path where we start to talk about all these more complex options. And so one of the things that I struggle with sometimes is when I see these, you know, late 40s, 50-year-old patients with muscular tendinous rotator cuff tears. Um, they, you know, maybe very, it may be degenerative, it may be mild, but just that tear pattern, we know the tissue quality in there is going to be not great. You know, we can't just repair the tendon back down to the bone. You can either try to repair the muscle back to the tendon. You can try to augment it. Um, you can try to just debris the tendon. There's, there's no great options. And I've had a lot of mixed results in terms of healing with those type of rotator cuff tears. And so, you know, that's just to kind of bring up something else in this conversation. It's, you know, I think we all want to get the first surgery to work. And so if you have a rotator cuff tear that you're attacking for the first time, how do we really get that to heal? And I spend a lot of time talking to patients about that. James, it's a nice segue into what I think is the next question here. You know, we've, you guys have talked about three nice, good kind of more salvage options. Um, one other thing that I'm never quite sure how it fits is what is the role of the revision rotator cuff repair with a patch? So I guess I'd ask you, Saran, what, what is the role for that option in your practice? So that's a, it's a, actually an option that I use um, not infrequently. So, I mean, if somebody has a, a failed cuff that's symptomatic and it looks like it's still repairable, um, and they're of a reasonable age with minimal arthritis or no arthritis that I would consider re-repairing it, um, I will do so. And, you know, if you look at Jay Keener's data, you know, two tendon tears, revision repair, the, the um, failure rate was 70%. So, you know, if we can improve on that with a graft, then potentially there's some value. Um, we've looked at our um, series of patients who have had revision repairs with grafts, and our healing rate is 50%. So that's what I quote to patients in two tendon pairs that I augment with a graft. I tell them it's a coin flip and let them decide whether it's something that they feel um, a chance that they want to take. What about you, Rob? Are, are you, when you get to the revision setting, are you jumping right to an SCR or um, is there a role for you for the revision cuff repair with a patch? Do you mean, Peter, do you mean a tendon, graft, bone, a, brid, a bridging patch or? Um, I mean, I, I, I mean more as an augment, or like augment. not as much as inter, in, interposition. I think that's what you're asking, right? Yeah, correct. Yeah. So you're, are you asking about interposition or? I'm asking about augment. Augment. Okay. Got it. Um, yeah. So I've been following Dr. Burkhart's lead uh, and doing SCR with repair over the top more in the revision setting, if particularly, I mean, I think that we all experience this kind of the barely repairable rotator cuff tear, you know, where maybe you're repairing it under a little bit more tension that you want, or should you medialize, you know, the footprints, um, or the tissue, you know, is just kind of poor quality. And, um, I think, you know, Mahata and, and some other thought leaders are, um, are showing that SCR, um, with with repair over the top is it as a good option to um, to reinforce that type of uh, repair construct yeah that's so it's so interesting to me when you when you talk about that because it's um you know you're talking about the the tendon that can barely come to the tuberosity and then trying to stretch it over an scr graft it's it seems like such an interesting option to, to do both and i um I've always wondered about the mechanics of, of if you ever had that happen where you intend to do that and you just can't get the tendon to reach because it could barely reach to begin with. Yeah. I mean, if it doesn't, you know, if it doesn't reach, then you, then you're stuck. But if it's the kind of um, tear where there's some tendon loss or, or whatever, and, um, and it will sort of barely come over, then I think that 
doing the SCR can reinforce that biomechanically. And then if the tendon doesn't heal, then you have at least the stability that's provided by the SCR graft, which have even the dermal grafts have pretty high rates of healing. So um, I think that's an attractive option. What about you, James? What 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 is the role of the rotation cuff repair with a patch in your practice? Who's who's the patient you're doing that on? So I I kind of agree with with Rob. So if it's a repair under a lot of tension, um, then or if I I can't quite get the repair all the way back over to the footprint, I'll usually use an SCR and medialize the rotator cuff repair uh, to the graft just so I'm I'm not putting under such heavy load. Um, if I if it's a revision repair or you know, and I can repair the tendon, then I'll usually use an onlay patch on top just to try to augment it. Um, one of the things I've started doing is uh, trying to add biologic augmentation. Uh, there's, we're just kind of exploring this. There's not a lot of data on this yet, but we're starting to do subacromial bursa reimplantation based on some of the work that's come out of our lab and Gus Mazaka's lab about how the bursa is a rich source of MSCs. And so we'll do our bursectomy, do our repair, and then reimplant the subacromial bursa on top of our repair just to try to add some biology back to the, the healing environment. And so, you know, too early to tell whether that has an effect, but we're continuing to kind of look at ways to improve this biologic repair process. Well, that leads us right into our next and probably final question, and that's regarding the use of biologics in rotator cuff surgery and actually even arthroplasty surgery. You know, given their popularity, but their unknowns and the potential controversy associated with out-of-pocket costs with lack of evidence, um, you know, James mentioned one way in which he uses biologic augmentation. Serena, any thoughts on using um, the, the bursal MSCs or other sources of MSCs or PRP when you're doing cuff surgery? I think um, that's a really great question. I, th I, I hadn't thought about using uh, what James is describing, so I think that's a cost-effective way to potentially employ biologics. I mean, other than the routine things that we do by um, microfracturing the bone, um, and even though there's limited MSCs available in the tuberosity, that's a, a cheap way to, to do it, and there is some uh, data to support doing that. So I will do that. Um, I've I've not routinely done PRP because, you know, there's, as you mentioned, the data is controversial, and there's actually some data that to show that um, healing rates have been worse with certain types of PRP. So um, I haven't routinely done that, and I don't routinely offer um, stem cells or MSCs um, to patients um, unless they bring it up and we discuss the cost. But I can tell you that most patients that I talk about um, that problem with them at the end of the conversation, they're really not interested, and that may be my bias shining through. Well, it's tough. I think the cost can create um, a big problem for many patients, but even those that where it's not an issue, the evidence is certainly not convincing yet, but growing and interesting. Rob, any role for biologic augmentation in your practice for rotator cuff surgery? Yeah, similar to, to Serena. I mean, I haven't done a lot of regular use because of lack of, you know, lack of data and then the cost issue. Um, where we're doing a lot of these SCRs, you know, in the hospital setting, you're going to lose a bundle of money on the case anyway. And so I think that it's not, you know, a few hundred dollars on, on, uh, the, and the, um, equipment for spinning down PRP isn't, you know, is like a drop in the bucket, but, um, at ambulatory surgery centers where cost is a big deal. Um, I think it's, it's hard to justify, um, given the lack of data. Yeah, I think it's a, certainly an interesting field with biologics, and you guys have provided a lot of good talking points for better understanding rotator cuff pathology and the variety of options for treating these difficult patients, and we really appreciate it. We think, you know, right now that's all the time we have for this podcast, but certainly the conversation can continue and should continue as we get educated and learn more about rotator cuff pathology. We want to thank you all so much for taking time out of your day to spend this podcast with us. For all of our shoulder and elbow listeners out there, don't forget to subscribe. For Peter Chalmers, I'm Rachel Frank, and we'll see you next time.